So welcome back to part two of week five's lecture. The story of Angkor really began in the ninth century when Jayavarman II established uh, his new capital on uh, Mount Mahendra Pavarta, uh, also known as Phnom Kulen, in 1802. And this, in effect, unified all the Khmer people. Uh, what he did then was also to initiate the cult of the Devaraja. So in the Devaraja, we have the god personified as a human being, as a monarch, and therefore the Devaraja is also a god king. Over time, in order to show up new political bases, different kings during the cross the Angkorian period have turned to institute different state religions. In the early years, it was Shaivism that was adopted, principally uh, uh, the worship of Shiva as the central deity, hence the predominance of the Linga Yoni sculpture uh, that you see on the left here on the screen, which we will discuss more about later. Uh, though, in general, when we talk about Hinduism, we, when we say Hindus worship three aspects of uh, the same Godhead, uh, which are normally known as Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, uh, each of them representing a different aspect, namely the creator, the preserver, and the destroyer, or the renewer. Uh, nevertheless, when it comes to actual practice itself, followers tend to follow either, uh, subscribe to uh, principally uh, believe in Vishnu, or Shiva as the main deity of worship. Uh, therefore, uh, by the time of when Angkor Wat was constructed during the 12th century, the official religion uh, of the state had already changed from Shaivism, or the worship of Shiva, to Vaishnavism, which saw Vishnu being installed as the principal main deity. However, later on, it was Mahayana Buddhism that came to replace uh, Shiva and Vishnu uh, uh, during the construction of the Bayon Temple, uh, of which we will talk more about later. So uh, besides inaugurating a new capital and being the founding dynasty, I guess uh, what is important when we think of Phnom Kulen is that our historians have also connected uh, this founding moment to uh, a different artistic style that have began to flourish uh, during its founding. Uh, so when you see on the screen here, uh, compared to the Pala, Indian Pala sort of high relief of uh, depicting Vishnu that you see on the right, uh, the Kulin style uh, of, uh, from Cambodia uh, that you, we have at the center uh, began to dispense with the use of supporting arches. So the sculpted body is in this case rigid and up right, uh, with a much more rounder face and broader eyebrows, but you also get essentially what we consider as a more freestanding kind of sculpture, rather than in the form of a high relief, uh, that the sculptural form is uh, closely still attached to a, uh, to a base, uh, to a vertical base, such as the one in the uh, Pala example that you see here on the screen. Okay. But it is actually towards a different class of sculpture that scholars like uh, Ashley Thompson uh, actually ask us to pay more attention to in order to help us uncover what is the nature of uh, Angkor as a political system. What Thompson was suggesting here is that Angkor as, as a polity, as a political system, is really one that is marked by sexual differences. And this was exemplified in the form of the Linga Yoni sculpture. Here, Yoni as a metaphor or as a symbol of the, that is often connected to the womb or the female, um, uh, expresses the condition of possibilities, while the Linga, which is the upright protuberance, uh, vertically sort of like sticking out of the, the Yoni, uh, takes on a much more phallic quality and it is often described as a point of manifestation of action and initiation. So therefore, very often we think of the Shiva or, or the Linga as an active principle 
as much as he is a destructive principle, whereas the yoni is therefore a much more passive base uh, on which action uh, is visited upon something. So by using the construction as a reading technique, what Thompson then tries to tease out and answer is perhaps where is the place of the female or where is the place of the women within such a political system, especially when epigraphic records were predominantly male-centered and women were accorded very little historical emphasis in the textual information that have survived through these records. Uh, however, in deconstruction, uh, emphasis is placed upon the patterns and structures inherent in the visual language of the object itself, as well as its tendency to view linguistic and ideological phenomena in terms of binary opposites or contradictions. And therefore, when we think of high and low, light and dark, masculine and feminine, truth and falsehood, we think of this as binaries that are also ideologically and value-laden. They're not uh, transparent or they're not sort of like neutral. Uh, so this type of approach then tries to identify and see where these binaries exist within how culture is uh, being structured uh, through a specific sort of cultural expressions. Right? Uh, and therefore, when we, when we approach uh, it this way, what it ultimately suggests is that there is an indeterminacy of sort of like meaning, um, perhaps an aspect of an artwork that is beyond uh, logical understanding, and that it contains multiple sort of definitions of self rather than a set fixed meaning that is ascribed uh, to the artwork or how it's dominantly sort of interpreted. Okay, so in this sense, what is visual is also seen as textual on some level. Uh, and uh, a deconstruction technique often suggests that meaning of the text is not something that is stable. It is the text itself actually contains multiple meanings that are constantly subverting and contradicting the assertions that have been accepted as mainstream. Uh, so what does it mean in this context? When we look at the Linga and Yoni uh, construction here, uh, very often it's taken as an article of faith that contains a Hindu-Buddhist uh, expression or concept of power expressed as a union of the linga, the phallic, and the yoni, the vaginal. However, the linga within this historical reading or within this mainstream view of the tradition tends to be seen as principally the active, the violent, and the masculine force. Uh, and uh, therefore, often it is seen as something that initiates change so as an initiating principle, it is also seen as the most active kind of principle whereby the feminine or the yoni is therefore seen as passive, something to be subdued and therefore on a lower register compared to the more active force. In a deconstruction reading, a researcher will be analyzing the specific object to explore if the object contains uh, any contradiction to this belief paying attention to its build, its form, and rather than therefore saying that the feminine or the passive energy is inert, uh, what it's suggesting here is that there's a creative dimension that we can then sort of uh, look, uh, we can recognize in uh, this, uh, in the yoni itself. Uh, so rather than saying that the feminine or the passive energy is something that is creative too, or that's active as well, uh, this is avoided in a deconstruction reading because the logic of the cosmology doesn't actually support it. Rather, by looking at the linga and yoni configuration, researchers like uh, Ashley Thompson have argued that the feminine yoni configuration in the sculpture acts as the very pedestal and therefore could be said to be foundational to the Khmer Hindu-Buddhist concept of masculine, active, creative energy. It is this foundation that makes creativity possible because it frames uh, the active principle 
uh, simply by being the base, the horizontal pedestal uh, from which anything else uh, active can emerge as from. Therefore, the yoni itself functions as a frame or in deconstruction terminology, a paragon uh, in this instance. And paying attention to the paragon or the framing device helps the researcher to understand and recognize the central role that the opposite gender play in, re in actually defining what creative power and political power is in the Cambodian context, often requiring the male king to perform rituals to subdue or, uh, the, the female other or the feminine force uh, that is seen often as an anxious threat to his ability to create and maintain order and become a king. So even though we recognize the fact that uh, there is a dimension of gender inequality within this, uh, this uh, configuration of gender within society, it is to recognize where this anxiety also lies that makes us become aware of uh, how uh, sexual differentiation plays a very important part in structuring uh, kingship concepts of kingship within Khmer society. So this has actual social ramification in the form that the king is actually also not just someone who controls ideological discourse, but someone who is an engineer. He controls the actual resources. Uh, and in Phnom Kulen, which is located high up uh, in the mountain, it was an important source of water. Uh, so therefore, uh, the king is also someone who controls irrigation knowledge, uh, which was central to the growth of the city. What we see here is that irrigation knowledge was artistically complemented in the form of the 1,000 lingas. Uh, so it's a landscape filled with tiny little uh, bridgeheads, uh, small little sort of like sculpted lingas across a huge terrain. Uh, it was a project that began sometime in the 11th and 12th century and was apparently, uh, according to sources, carved by a hermit, li hermits living in that area. Essentially, these were carved riverbeds of stone, mainly in the form of lingams, in the form of the bumps neatly arranged uh, uh, and patterned to cover the surface of a sandstone bedrock uh, on, on which water would flow past. This was water that would irrigate the entire Angkor region. Therefore, anyone with uh, control over the discourse, uh, the very gendered kind of discourse of uh, what political power means in the Angkorian context, was also controlling something very tangible. That is the water resource uh, that is distributed and that was much needed by a city that would have been sustaining at its peak uh, a population of one million people. So let's turn also then to think about uh, what are some of the temple architectures through which you might uh, find a different way to understand where does the feminine reside. Uh, one of the earliest temples that have uh, survived uh, uh, that was not actually built by a monarch, uh, concentrated in 1967 AD, was the Batai Sri. Uh, the name itself uh, means a citadel of women or citadel of beauty. This is a modern name and it is probably given or to the temple uh, in relation to the intricacy of its base relief carvings uh, found along the walls and the tiny dimensions of the buildings themselves. They're really small in comparison with the large scale monumental uh, buildings such as Angkor Wat that we find later. So it's something that was constructed by two courtiers and dedicated to Shiva uh, and over time have sort of like, you know, uh, shifted in terms of its sort of like focus of worship according to the political temperature of that period. So what's unique about this temple, the Batan Sri, uh, the citadel of women, is that it's built largely out of hard red sandstone. Uh, bearing in mind that it was never called Batan Sri, uh, but because of its sort of intricacy and delicacy, it's often later projected as a women's space. Uh, and this kind of space, uh, uh, it's an evidence of an earlier kind of built construction that would be very different from how Angkor Wat uh, would look like later on, right? 
Therefore, if we compare it to Angkor Wat, uh, we see how important the decorative elements that form the base relief friezes of Angkor Wat really draws from this tradition and attention to details. The inner walls of the outer gallery, of course, is famous. Uh, because it bears a series of large-scale scenes, mainly depicting episodes from the Hindu epics of Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Uh, uh, central to this, of course, was the base relief of the churning of the milk, the sea of milk, uh, that shows Vishnu at the center, his turtle Abhata Kurma below, and the Ashuras and Devas on his left and right. Uh, of the, uh, and all of these uh, tends to take on very symbolic meaning. Some scholars would suggest that the, the, the number of Ashuras uh, themselves are representative of the number of days from winter solstice to the spring equinox and therefore operating as a kind of calendrical uh, system. The centrality of this frieze would give you a sense that uh, by the 12th century, uh, the commissioning of Angkor Wat shows that uh, Vishnu has then became uh, the principal deity uh, of the state religion. In the interest of time, I won't go into detail about uh, the, uh, the details of this uh, Angkor Wat uh, because I would rather you spend more time going through the Google Street View link that I've included and explore the site yourself and we can sort of discuss this uh, in detail uh, during class. What I want to point out is that uh, besides uh, narrating these uh, Hindu epics uh, that are very clearly uh, referencing the Ramayana and the Mahabharata as a primary source and a very important literary source through which uh, power, society, and the relationship between king and subject uh, is described to these stories uh, that, uh, that are borrowed from India, littered across the Angkor Wat are more than 2,000 portraits of Devatas. Uh, these are like the Apsara figures that you see up here on the screen. Uh, and these are sacred feminine or female figures uh, that uh, tend to show them in carved in a very highly detailed manner and often contain uh, very detailed iconographic clues to how women used to dress alongside objects and activities that are often associated with the female uh, domain. Uh, so scholars have, rather than only turning to uh, the main sort of story that you see on the gallery, uh, a lot of, increasingly a lot of scholars are also paying attention to the highly detailed portraits of the Vatas that often function as ornamental devices all around the Angkor Wat in order to sort of understand uh, uh, an aspect of, uh, of Angkor history, uh, namely the women's history of sort of Angkor, that are not often given prominence or pride of place within the central narrative of Angkor. Finally, Angkor also underwent a period in which it took on Mahayana Buddhism as its main official religion. And this can be seen in the Bayon Temple. So in the Bayon Temple, we see the towers being built and designed in a new way. Now, there, uh, what is included in those towers are uh, giant faces uh, that, fa uh, that, that looks out at four different directions, and they are part of uh, King Jayavarman's attempt to construct a temple complex that expresses certain ideas and concepts connected to Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it fulfills and even takes uh, the cult of the Devaraja to a new height, to a greater height, and this is uh, translated in Buddhist term as the Chakravarti, which is the universal ruler. So he is no longer a god king, but he is a universal ruler. And this then sits on top of an earlier concept of the Devaraja, 
but takes on cosmic significance. What's beautiful about the temple is that it's also structured in a gradated manner. So in the outer gallery, we find uh, carvings uh, depicting historical events and everyday life. Uh, and very often there's a structured way that you can view these galleries, beginning with the eastern entrance. Uh, you see soldiers, you see musicians, you see horsemen. Uh, and also uh, various sort of like trade activities as well as uh, fishing activities along the Tongle South, which is the main river. Uh, there's also market scenes. Uh, it's a picture of life and, uh, and vivacity, showing uh, what Khmer life was like uh, uh, right before its eventual decline. And then it moves on uh, towards uh, another segment that focuses on war, where the principal enemy are the Chams, uh, who were occupying what is now the south of Vietnam. Uh, so the Khmer and the Chams were often seen to be at loggerheads. We can learn from these freezers who the principal enemies of the Khmer's were during this period. Uh, however, more interestingly, war battle was also uh, part of a larger ceremonial and performative tradition. You see alongside battle formation and military procession, also royal entertainments that showcases athletes, jugglers, and acrobats uh, alongside animal procession, uh, and ways in which all these things contribute to a kind of performance. Uh, so winning is about being accorded and honored with, you know, a hero's feast, right? Uh, advancement and retreat, all of these take on larger than life ceremonial characters that plays out not only in the present day, but also confirms what uh, historical epics have been telling over and over again. And therefore, there is a cyclical nature in which contemporary events then also fulfills events of the past and, rec and fulfills uh, what it recognizes to be a kind of prophecy. Okay. And uh, out, uh, of all these sort of like worldly activities that happen in the outer gallery, as you enter into the inner gallery, then the mythological and the courtly uh, take center stage. Uh, the inner gallery is moreover raised above the ground and decorated chiefly with scenes from, scenes from Hindu mythology, even though this is a Buddhist temple, right? Uh, and therefore, there you here you find uh, the more celestial kind of understanding of the world uh, connected to the gods uh, being depicted uh, on the panel, on the frieze here. Uh, after which, uh, what is at the center, the most distinctive feature is in fact the multitude of serene and smiling stone faces on the many towers which jut out above the upper terrace and cluster around its center peak and central peak. Each tower has around two to four faces uh, and 200 of these faces still exist. So imagine uh, what used to be like uh, 40, 49 towers uh, out of which I think 39 remains today. Uh, all these faces staring off in many different directions. Uh, and it's really a kind of um, a, a statement about the all-seeing eye of the Buddha, right? Uh, although later, when Cambodian society then, uh, Khmer people then converted to Theravada Buddhism, this, would, this temple would be uh, uh, abandoned. Uh, what we see here are really a statement on uh, Buddhist concepts of kingship. Uh, here, kingship is structured as a kind of omniscient. If the Buddha is omniscient, and if he is all-knowing and all-seeing, then therefore the king should be able to manifest and express this quality as well. Uh, and we also find this in terms of you know, Sanskritic concept like the perfection of wisdom, often personified as a female goddess in the Prajna Paramita. Uh, here, it's really one of the most important texts of Buddhism, where uh, 
uh, the Prashna Paramita is a text about the penetration of, of reality uh, from falsehood or illusion. Uh, and in its, uh, in its uh, manifestation as a deity, it often takes the form of an all-seeing deity. Uh, one that has faces that looks out at all different directions and it's deeply connected to esoteric Buddhism. Uh, and, uh, and how esoteric Buddhism is practiced as a state religion. As a state religion, then it confirms and dignifies the king as a personification or a manifestation or an incarnation of, uh, of the Buddha and therefore takes on all these qualities and have all these qualities of uh, omniscience, of all-knowingness, uh, connected to his being. Uh, therefore, in the building of, for example, another temple associated with Jaya Varman VII in uh, 1186, uh, the temple called Taprom, uh, as an ancestral temple, is something that was dedicated to both Prajna Paramita and to his mother as well. In many ways, these are attempts, some of the attempts uh, that scholars, different scholars are trying to weave in the feminine. So in doing so, they turn to different sources, some looking at the ornamental dimensions of architecture, others looking at specific deities and expressions of these deities and how they're connected to and referencing uh, specific historical uh, persons uh, connected to power within Khmer society and scholars like Ashley Thompson then took perhaps a much more uh, unique approach by using deconstruction to understand uh, the very basis in which uh, gender and sexual difference actually structures the way power is conceived within Cambodian society. Okay. So in our last part, we'll look at uh, and, uh, how the, this, our thinking about uh, Angkor Wat. If Borobudur was very much a reconstruction of a long buried archaeological ruin, uh, Angkor, Angkor Wat had a different, very different history. You know, with Borobudur, the excavation was very much directed by uh, Stanford Raffles during his time as the British governor of Java from 1811 to 1816. And when the Java itself was briefly administered by the British, uh, owing to the fact that the Netherlands were invaded by the French general Napoleon Bonaparte and therefore had to cede uh, its colonies to uh, the British. Uh, this was before, of course, Raffles went on to open up Singapore as a British free port. Uh, uh, so with the Borobudur, what you have was really an archaeological area that have survived over time as a kind of larangan or forbidden territory. Uh, and these were even recorded in the Javanese Babats or the Javanese Chronicles uh, that states that the, the, that area is kind of like bad luck, so therefore do not go there. In a sense, what we see of Borobudur today was very much a rediscovery and a very slow process of reconstruction involving archaeologists piecing together various kinds of ruins, like a jigsaw puzzle, in order to have what we have today, what we see today. Now, for the longest time, there was a similar perception when it came to the Angkor Wat, uh, where it was believed that you know uh, the French uh, explorer Henri Muho uh, was someone who rediscovered a long lost civilization. Uh, of course, this was, cannot be further from the truth in the Angkor context. Uh, so, Cambodian legends often describe how Angkor Wat was something that was already rediscovered by the mid 16th century by a Cambodian king on an elephant. And of course, while this is a legend, we do know from evidence at Angkor itself that there were constant returns of various kings, even while the capital had later on been moved down to Phnom Penh today. Uh, so inscriptions uh, survive in the Angkor period, uh, such as this, 
from the 16th century onwards that describe uh, the completion of various renovation projects and the erection of various base reliefs uh, in Angkor Wat itself uh, that has been noted to be left unfinished during the 12th century. In fact, we also have, for example, illustrated plants that have been found in Japan uh, from the 18th century uh, that could very much point to uh, the uh, Japanese interpreters having had the opportunity to visit Cambodia on board a Dutch ship on a mission uh, uh, directed by the third Tokugawa shogunate uh, of Japan then during the Edo period. Uh, cause, uh, some of these maps, of course, are not the easiest uh, type of maps to read and does not find uh, necessarily equivalent correspondences, but note the drawing also revealed the four causeways that lead to a center. And many scholars believe that these are, uh, this is a possible kind of map that shows uh, the Japanese presence uh, and visit to Angkor during the 18th century, a period which historically Angkor was thought to be completely abandoned. And of course, a recent, more recent scholarship have also found various kinds of inscription, including uh, kanji character inscriptions that seems to suggest that there has, this visit was actually sort of true. Uh, so archaeological inscriptions from later time, uh, called the middle period, and this refers to the early 15th to the 16th, uh, to the mid 19th century, uh, did uh, sort of suggest that um, its historical importance was not lost altogether, even though Angkor perhaps underwent a period of decline and contraction. So where you find these inscriptions, they commemorate the construction of stupas during this time, uh, after the period of supposed abandonment, and there are also commemorative rituals that continue to be practiced today to uh, show that this linkage uh, connected to ancestral honoring uh, is something that is very much alive within Cambodian society today. And of course, uh, the legacy of Angkor lived on in other different parts of mainland Southeast Asia. Uh, we see how it became very important uh, in we have mentioned in the, uh, in the previous lecture how important it was in uh, shaping the ideology and the political system of Ayutthaya uh, uh, as the Siamese then became, became, began to borrow a lot of the, uh, political concepts from Khmer in order to found and institute a new empire uh, based along the Chao Phraya River. But of course, it also lives on later on and informed the imagination of uh, contemporary artists and filmmakers as well, both modern and contemporary artists and filmmakers. Nanyang, I, within the Nanyang imagination amongst like, uh, the Chinese modern artists and, uh, of, of, of the 20th century, uh, those who thought of Southeast Asia saw Angkor as uh, this, uh, as a site of great allure, right? Uh, and this has been commemorated in uh, Wong Kar Wai's uh, film, In the Mood for Love, where you see Tony Leung at the end of the film, in the concluding part of the film, whispering into the ruins of Angkor uh, as the Devatas look on in an adjacent dilapidated wall, suggesting that there is a kind of deep-seated connection uh, between Angkor and this new imagination of what artists coming from China was trying to sort of understand what makes Nanyang Nanyang, what makes Southeast Asia Southeast Asia. And in a strange way, Angkor figures very strongly in this imagination.